G'day fans, and we're back talking Star Trek Discovery, ripping apart those episodes and having a wonderful time in the process. This is going to be a really, really good episode tonight because we've got lots to talk about. MPS, how are you doing tonight, mate? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm um, I'm all uniformed up as per usual and ready to go. Let's go. Very good. Now, unlike like last week where it was a part one of an episode, instead of being part two this week, it's a completely different thing. It's far from mm. home. So MPS, what did you think of it, old son? Uh, I kind of felt like they were doing a bit of a Walking Dead sort of thing where they, you know, start off a storyline and then you get really intrigued and then they fob you off to somewhere else, which is kind of what they did. Um, overall, I thought the episode was had some awesome parts in it, but I thought it was pretty mediocre for the rest of it, really. It was sort of like a standard nothing sort of episode. And there was a few bits that emotionally could have been so much more dramatic, but they just, I think they missed that, but we'll get to those later on. Um, what I really did like is how they presented the, after the ship had crashed with the flashing lights and the crew sort of dealing with the issues that they had and how that was all presented and the fact they didn't know where they were or when they were and had no communications and they all bandied together to try and get everything fixed. I thought that was actually um, kind of groovy. Worked out really, really well. I noticed there was one thing that sort of threw me a bit was, you know, you're in the 22nd century or whatever it is that they're, well, yeah, technology from the 22nd century, but they're still using grinders. Like, you know, the medical the medical girl comes up and goes, Zzz, and she's fixed, and you know, and all of a sudden they're using grinders and sparks are flying and all that sort of stuff. It's like, hang on a second, shouldn't you have some sort of more advanced tech for, for that than just, you know, like hammers and saws and drills and crap? You mean like freaking laser beams? <laughs> Out of their freaking eyes. Yes, something like that. Um, in terms of like some of the characters and stuff, I thought out of all of them, Saru was the one who just shown right out. He was really, really good this episode. He took control. He was very like confident in his abilities, looked after the crew, pointed them in the right direction, stood up to Giorgio. You know, not everybody does that because everybody seems to cower in front of her, but you know, he stood up to her and put her in a place. And I thought out of everybody, he clearly had the best characterization uh, going mm. around. Even at those things that popped out of his head, how good was that? So uh, yes, he was definitely the standout character of the episode. Yeah, we haven't seen those for a while. And now that he knows how to control them, that's that's an even better thing. So, you know, because there was that bit, and we'll jump. What do you reckon? We jump straight to the fight scene? I, I, I loved it. I thought, I thought, well, it's it's Discovery. We can jump anywhere we want, really, that's can't exactly we? exactly right. That's the point of it. Exactly. <laughs> yep, go for it. I love the fight scene. Michelle Yeoh is just a phenomenal um, fighter. You know, she's done a lot of films. The first film that people re would recognise her in was Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And she's gone on to be so much more better than that. And as she ages, she gets better. You know, so some of those moves, you're looking at some of the younger guys going, you wouldn't be able to pull that off. But she is just phenomenal. Um, did you notice that the bad guy from from that that scene was was the guy that played, I think his name was, was Jake from um, Medium. You know, we haven't seen that guy in years. And all of a sudden he's popped up and he's got the mustache and he looks like a 70s sort of, you know, reject. And I was like, hang on a second. It took me a little while to figure it out, but I thought it was, you know, really good of him being cast as a bad guy for once. He doesn't really get cast that often in, in that sort of role. And Tilly standing up to herself, being her, her ensign-like self, but at the same time, you know, explaining why she does what she does, which was good when they were walking towards the thing. Um, and then right at the end, smashing the bottle over his head saying, you know, that's awesome. So I, she, was, she was great there. Yeah, I'll tell you what, they had the frizzy hair thing going on big time. Yeah. I mean, it has it grown between seasons. It's like it's got a life of its own, this fringy sort of gingery sort of look. It's like, wow, it's really out of control. But yeah, that sequence when, uh, with her and Saru on the planet when they're walking together, that was probably one of the more better character uh, moments uh, between the two of them. The only, the only part I didn't like about that was the fact they walked again. Like, oh. Haven't they got a shuttlecraft or something? No, like, mate, everything's that. busted. It's all broken. No, just, the ship, well. just the big ship is busted. The little ships inside should be oh, fine. Freaking hell, you and your walking, mate, what can I say? You were talking about Giorgio earlier. It's funny because some fans are sort of warming to her and some fans aren't because they're saying, well, she's a sort of like a bit of a characterization of herself in regards to like, well, I'm the bad girl of town, you know, I'm not um, obligated to follow the Federation rules. If I'm going to come in here and kick some heads, I'm just going to come here and kick some heads, right? And uh, it's working for some people, but not working for others. But I guess 
she has the ability of doing things that the Federation staff league can't do. Mm. And they say, well, we need someone to punch this dude's lights out. We can't do it because it violates the prime directive. But Giorgio, hey, you're from the mirror universe. Kick the shit out of him and have a whale of a time. So uh, <laughs> it's um, yeah, it's sort of interesting. And, and uh, yeah, fan reaction towards, uh, towards her has sort of been a bit divided in that regard. What I really like from a cinematic point of view is actually the sequence in the uh, medical bay. You know, when you start off with Stamets on the bed and you just sort yeah. of like tilt down, it's just him by himself. And I was thinking... Mm where's everybody else? And then you come back and it's just chock full of dudes. And I thought, of course, yeah, because yeah, he's in a coma, he's, com he's seeing everything completely different. I thought that was a very, very nice moment. And uh, yeah, well done from a, a production point of view, which I thought was kind of groovy. And then Steve. they do the silly thing. Sorry, then they do the silly thing of putting him in the, in the thing and saying, well, if you can rephrase, if you can spell out, um, my partner bought me out of a coma and all I got was his lousy t-shirt. And then he's allowed to go and fix something that later on actually turned out to be nothing you know, it wasn't like an engineering thing. Anyone could have just unplugged this thing and plugged the new one in. But, you know, for whatever reason, they, they got the guy who can't walk, basically, and the girl who's busted back is is there. And Yeah, that's a work. good point. A few people picked up on that and saying, why was Stamets forced to go into the Jeffrey's tube when they could have just got a normal dude, especially when a normal dude turned up? And yeah. I think it was the lady said, you want to help? And Jet said, no, you can just go away. And a lot of people thought that's just dumb. It's like there are other people on the ship, 88 of them, in fact. So uh, you do sort of wonder what the deal was with um, uh, that. So you're right. Uh, it's it's definitely one of the more iffier moments. Speaking of Jet, Jet Renault clearly has the best lines in the entire show. Just straight <laughs> shooting. Absolute fantastic. You can just imagine all these other TV shows and movies where a character like that would just stand right out. And the fact that she pointed to the dude in the hazmat suit, you know, clean up on aisle five, and, refer <laughs> and he refers to himself as Gene so subtly, yeah. right? And of course, that's obviously a very subtle reference to Gene Roddenberry. And she just says straight away, I've already forgotten it. I mean, that's absolutely magnificent. A couple of people have been a bit critical of that particular sequence, but you know, that's, that's their issue to deal with. Although, interestingly, with Gene in the hazmat suit, Apparently, they didn't even credit him as Gene in the hazmat suit in the end credits. So he's just a random dude, even though he's got a name, Gene. I thought that was actually one of those little subtle gags you got to love. So, so, so he's yeah. got a name and he's got a line. He would have got paid extra for that, but no one knows who he is. No one knows who he I is. Actually exactly th right. I, I sort of thought that was an awesome scene. Is like, how would you want to be that crewman in general that has to clean up that mess? You know, dead, dead Leyland all around you splattered you know and all you picking it up and shoveling it into a bucket and you're going oh that's just the worst job you could possibly ask for i think see some people would look at that and go that's a little bit gruesome and out of control but i thought you know what it's a modern world you can do it i mean discovery's had some pretty gruesome scenes in previous seasons anyway so why not and i thought that was actually kind of good and the fact that it was on a bit of leland on um, Giorgio's boot uh, was kind of <laughs> I had to make sure she finished them off <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's you can do. Yeah, that's that's definitely a deleted scene where you see uh, her kicking the living shit at him. So I reckon that would actually be quite funny. Um, so we get to the planet, right? We've got the planet, the colony, and all the rest of it, right? And there's arguments as to whether the planet is the same planet from the first episode. Chances are it probably is. Um, you got the bar, right? The saloon. I mean, the original series of Star Trek was sometimes known as a western in space, and this one really was a western in space with the swinging doors. You know, you had the big sort of like the bar, the dude wiping the bar down. And even when the bad guy turned up, uh, Zara with his jingling like spurs, what's the deal with that? The only thing they were missing, as you would well know, is a piano player in the corner. You know, as soon as a hero's roll in, the piano player should just stop playing and everybody just looks, you know, like the poker players. Well, what's going on there? It's like, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's cute, but unbelievably wanky at the same time. What do you reckon? Yeah, it. look, I, I thought it you know with all the modern technology however they are in a different place and, and it really could be anything i thought maybe it could have been a little bit um more spaced up um yeah. you know in terms of it didn't have to look like it was from the 1800s yeah you know yeah. western sort of american uh thing but i did love the fact that they beamed from the bottom to the top yeah that was very clever you know finally some actual smart technology I like it how they beam just outside the doors rather than just inside the venue, right? So does that mean that you yeah. beam outside the swinging doors and you go, yeah, I've changed my mind. I don't want to go in now and I'll just beam back out again. So with the reality in the ship, I like the idea that they've classed the Discovery as a classic, which I thought was kind of groovy. And it was all like we mentioned earlier, like they've got now a formally 88 crew members on board. And a few people have actually asked. It's like, okay, from the previous season and you know, our main cast, our main crew said, yep, we're all happy to go to the future and all the rest of it. So what about the other 70, whatever, 82 people back still on board? Did they have a decision or not? Now, apparently the story is that the crew complement of the Discovery was 200, which means some people have actually left. So the rest of the 80 something who have remained in the lower decks, did they all agree to the big change as well? And of course you could potentially argue for future stories that not all of them 
are going to be happy that they're in the future because all their friends, their family, they're all long gone now. And, um, well, they could just bypass it altogether. But, you know, dealing with the whole lower decks thing, you could actually end up with people who say, you know what, uh, yeah, coming here was a bad move. Uh, we'd ra rather go back to where we came from. And uh, I don't think they will do it because that just has spin-offs written everywhere. But uh, it could certainly potentially um, allow for that to occur if they wanted to do it because clearly our heroes are happy to do it. But is everybody else? Mm, that's the question. So there you go. Yeah, look, I, I think on that, you would find that there would be a bunch of people who were just in it for the space travel. They probably have no home or anything mm. like that. So, you know, wherever they go, they go. Um, and, you know, the, the main crew will go because it's in their contract. <laughs> well, exactly right. I like that one too. Very, very good. Uh, parasitic ice. Ice that grows on your ship and does horrible oh. things to it. It's like, wasn't that a threat that was just never going to go anywhere? It was like, yeah, right. It's not like the whole thing's going to crush and suddenly at the end of the show and everybody's dead and da-da-da. So uh, I thought that was actually kind of a bit, a bit of a little gag that was like you didn't really need but i, I suppose that it, it was a good plot device for the end bit which we will cover at the end which is uh, kind mm. of groovy um and a the, lot of people a lot of fans are really dialed into the lieutenant detma thing with her head right she's yeah. clearly not 100 percent there is, is a ptsd mm. from the shenzu incident or she just got a you know a bad headache or is a control making its reappearance because don't forget the data sphere is still on board the ship so uh you never know a lot of people think oh mate control's coming back through her little implant thing oh she's clearly not right but uh yes uh, a lot of people are going to be watching that one with great interest she, she certainly did have a few points where every time you looked at her it was almost like she paused every time someone mm -hmm. said or, or did something you know it was like in her head it looks like the hamster's going well if i flip the coin do i do it this way or do i do it that way so yeah i, I think she'll be she's she's the one to watch i think she may be that sneaky little dark horse coming out later on with some sort of big surprise very good and speaking of surprises uh somebody had mentioned like at the end with zara when they said okay here's your bag and that bugger off out of the saloon get into the ice and whatever else Someone had said, I hope they remember to take his personal transporter off him. Otherwise, and here's, get ready for your quote. Otherwise, he gets to do an Arnie, which is? I'll be back. <laughs> love it. <laughs> now, <laughs> some, some technical, tricky, nerdy stuff. I've got to love this. Now, I've got to, I've got to struggle to pronounce this correctly, right? It's mentioned a couple of times in the episode. The Vidraish, Vidraish, right? I've probably got that wrong. Trick nerds are probably screaming at their TV right now, right? Vidraish, right? Now, apparently, we believe it's the pigeon word for fed federation, okay? And there's a, a, a mindset thinking, uh, maybe the federation has, um, it's like an insulting slang term. And mm. it's hard to say whether, like the federation, as we know, it is split into two different bits or whether it's the federation entirely so but apparently in the short treks episode of calypso which is set in the distant future beyond discovery as in the current season uh vidraish uh gets mentioned there as well and there's been a bit of discussion as to exactly what it really really means whether it's just a, a bastardized term for the federation of people for people who don't like the federation or whether the federation has gone through a bit of a change because as we saw in the last episode they've clearly lost the, a lot of their structure lost a lot of planets out of the system so um yeah, it's, that one's got a lot of trick fans like mulling over that one, like completely losing their nuts. So, uh, which is uh, very, very good stuff. So, keep your eyes on that one. So, uh, you go. On. I was going to say, there's one other thing that sort of got me a bit sort of on the back foot. Um, oh, I can't think of his name now. The bad guy. Um, Zara. Zara. So, I know. I get yeah. plenty of new names. He came and went that quickly. Whatever. So yeah. Yeah, I know. He he all of a sudden knew about discovery and knew about time travel. Yes. Of the discovery, I was like, hang on a second, something. Something's not right here. So um, maybe things have happened in the 12 or the year, I was going to say 12 months, but in the year since Michelle was there uh, and, and word has gotten around. It's Michael, by the way, not Michelle. <laughs> Michael, Michelle, Michelle, Michael. <laughs> well, who, who calls a girl Michael anyway? I oh, know. Anyway, uh, you are absolutely right. And I thought... I thought about that myself and I thought, well, the audience knows everything that's going on, right? The last thing you probably need is now an, a new character to go, so where exactly are you guys from already? Da, 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 and go through the whole process and they go, yeah, 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 we're from the past, you know, 900 years back and then discovery. Da. So maybe that was just a, a narrative way of just getting through the crap really, really quickly. But you are right, though, in that he figured it out pretty damn fast. So, uh, yeah, so I thought that was probably a tad questionable as well. So um, yeah. there you go. Unless, unless... Michael has been throughout the entire time trying to converse with people through through the the Federation um, station that, that that she's at, and everyone's hearing it because if it's on all bands or, or bandwidths, then everyone will hear what she's looking for, and people might go back and do some history and really dig deep, and who knows. 
So that actually brings us to the very, very end, right? So uh, Michael appears, which a lot of people were very, very happy about. It's like, oh my God, yeah, he's got the new hairstyle going on and everything. Been stuck there in the in the future for a year. Yeah, that could have been really good. Where she goes, I've been looking for you for so long. Only one year. Really? Oh, well. If you had said, I've been, I've been waiting for you for five years, the look would have made more sense and everything would have been a bit different. And the, and the emotion would have been, oh my God, she's been there by herself for five years and it's taken you know, for what would have been a blink of an eye for her, five years for them to come through, that would have been far more or 10 years or whatever the case is. So, you know, yeah. something like that would have been a bigger number. Um, I just think the one year was a little bit weak. Well, it's a fair call because in the end, like we're struggling through the COVID crisis. That's almost been one year and yeah, we're nearly at the end of it. So, you know, it's like, come on, Michael, get over it. I agree that maybe 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years would have been the way to go. Now, but she's on board a ship, right? And there's all this speculation as to what ship it is. It could be a federation ship. Oh, probably is too, because in that one year, she sort of branched out and met people and done stuff. So here's one for you. I have the scoop, right? The nerd alert scoop as to what the name of the ship could be. Right. Yeah. So, as we know, with all the enterprises that we've seen in the past, have gone through A, B, C, D, and whatever. A thousand years later, they've probably gone through right through the Z, and they've had to restart it back to A again. Right. Now you can't just have another A because that just confuses the crap out of everybody. So you double up on the letters. And I am absolutely convinced. You heard it here first, not anywhere else on the internet. Here first. It is the NCC one seven zero one AA, and because dilithium power is struggling in the universe, there's no dilithium anywhere. The ship would be powered on batteries. Your Jewish cells. Yeah, mate. Energizer bunnies, mate. That's what's the crew is. <laughs> what is that? Or well, it could be I the can't wait. Huh? I can't wait till they get to I can't wait till they get to the Enterprise Double D. But that's a whole nother program. <laughs> yeah, that's when they rename it the Booby Prize. So there you go. But uh <laughs> now, now when we say it's the AA, we're not talking about it's full of like dudes who are drinking the uh, the wacky to you don't drink wacky tobacco, you drink on the, the the rocket fuel and <laughs> they're drinking the petrol. <laughs> <laughs> this is the AA, the batteries, all right? So uh, just sort of wanted to clarify that. So uh, there you go. I'm, I'm wondering if she's on the Discovery B, if she creates, if she's got another ship that's been part of the fleet and all of a sudden it's been decommissioned or she's fixed it up and she calls it the Discovery B and then they have two Discoveries and then, oh, wow, that's just going to cause mayhem um, and chaos as well. No, oh, golly, there you go. No bloody A, B, C, or D. All right. So that, uh, I think, just about wraps up the episode. Any final words before I get your score and your quick review uh, before we finish up? Um, I th- Oh, there was one other line that um, Giorgio said to, to the bad guy. She said, uh, it doesn't make you smart that you know big words. It just means you got a thesaurus. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. Other than that, no, I'm done. Yeah, and I also did like the fact that she said, you know, being wounded with the gun was just like four plays. Like, oh, yeah, okay, that just opens up a whole lot of pictures and images as to what her life is like. So there you go. All right, so your score out of five stars. What have you got there, MPS? Oh, I'm going to give it a three. Three stars this week. Harsh but fair. (laughs) Absolutely fantastic. For me personally, I loved the ship stuff. I really, really did. It was really, really good. But the saloon stuff kind of graded with me it just didn't work so i sort of i was going to give it a four but i've back rated it to 3.5 so it's higher than last oh. week but uh not as good as it could have been but you know we're heading in the heading in the right direction so uh there you go very very good stuff but hey this episode's come gone we're moving on to episode three which will be in a few days time and we shall see you then so until then make sure you keep your trekking tricky if that makes sense at all okay uru bye everyone across prosper.